Hi there, and welcome to the Guns of Tanakashima panel here for OnCon number four. That's right, the fourth OnCon. Isn't it glorious? Uh, a couple things before we start uh, the panel today. First things first, um, there's not going to be any anime videos because this is YouTube, which means that if I don't own the copyright, then that means I could accidentally shut down OnCon, and we do not want that. So, unfortunately, no anime videos. Uh, the second thing is is that this is going to be about firearms in Japan. This is not going to be about the pros and cons of firearms in general. There's not going to be a Second Amendment, American Second Amendment debate here. None of that stuff. It's just the historical significance of the Tanakashina matchlock on Japanese history. So now that we've got that out of the way, let's get into the panel. <laughs> One of the interesting things of the Tanakashima matchlock is that it pretty much shows up everywhere in anime. Um, you can see it in just about any type of anime. It's sci-fi, uh, slice of life. You can actually see it, of course, in the period pieces of the Warring States period. Um, just about anywhere. You'll see some semblance of the matchlock, uh, the Tanakashima matchlock, or some variant thereof of it. Um, so just to kind of show you a few examples of how prolific the, the matchlock is in anime, here's some examples. So here in Afro Samurai, we have an example of the Tanakashima matchlock being used. And uh, this anime is a little weird because it's not exactly the Warring States period. It's kind of some weird alternative universe involving magical headbands and things like that. But um, the, the use of the Tanakashima matchlock is pretty interesting in this anime. So here's a unique anime, Aria the Scarlet Animo. Um, basically, these are teens set in present day to uh, train, that train in a specific school to take on the criminal element with very specific weapons that they train on. And in the case of the person you see here, that is a Tanakashima matchlock. Kind of odd choice of weapons. And of course, in Inuyasha, you see the Tanakashima matchlock used all over the place in that anime, particularly in the Band of Seven storyline, which is the picture that you see here. Even though you don't see the villains, they are there off off uh, off screen, and that is a volley fire about to happen. Now, one of the things I liked about this particular scene is that. Um, it cuts to Shippo and Inuyasha and Kagome by a stream, kind of gathering up water and resting, and they hear the volley of fire. And Shippo and Inuyasha have no idea what that is. Shippo makes a guess that it might be some type of fireworks, but why would you do that during the day? But Kagome knows what that is. She knows that's gunfire. And so then that's kind of like the introduction to the storyline for them. And then, of course, there is Princess Mononoke, and here we see Lady Yaboshi with a, what looks like a matchlock, it's not exactly a Tanakashima matchlock, but it's a variant. Um, you know, normally the matchlock will be in the shoulder, not on top of the shoulder, but it's still very much looking like the Tanakashima matchlock. Uh, it's pretty, this anime movie, this great anime movie, is pretty interesting because it also shows the kind of the progression between the handheld Teppo cannon, which were the hand cannon, into an actual kind of individual firearm. And uh, of course, you just should watch this movie because it's Studio Ghibli and it's just wonderful. Anyway. So by these few examples, you can see that the Tanakashima matchlock is pretty prolific, even pervasive, in the world of anime. Pretty much any genre, slice of life even, um, science fiction, action, uh, drama, period pieces, the whole nine yards. You can find it in just about any anime at some point or another. And as you can tell, it has a pretty distinctive look to it. So when you see it, you know exactly what it is. And that's kind of unique because it, it means that there's a historical significance behind the weapon itself. And it is a very important weapon in Japanese history, particularly Japanese military history. So let's use the rest of our time here and talk about how the Tanakashima came about and why it's important in Japanese history and what's the deal with it. So um, let's start talking about it. So let's start with the invention of gunpowder. So of course black powder was um, discovered by accident really in the late 800s or late 9th century uh, AD. 
And it was done by the Chinese. Now, what was happening was that the nobility, the Chinese nobility, were looking for ways to live forever. So they sent out their alchemists to find various concoctions and try, you know, different herbs and minerals and things like that to achieve this effect. And while these alchemists were doing that, and uh, the Taoist monks actually got in on the act too, and because they were like, well, we can't find something to make someone immortal just yet. Maybe we can use some of this stuff as medicinal purposes. So as they were going through different chemical compounds, um, as primitive as, as uh, chemistry was back then, they were able to discover various things, uh, various uses of various plants for various reasons. Uh, everything from medicinal to um, cognitive to help the, the brain think more clearly, things like that. So the discovery of black powder as gunpowder was really accidental. They were really trying to look for the, the serum to immortality while the Taoists were also looking for something that would help heal wounds. And gunpowder, or actually black powder at the time, would help in cauterizing wounds and, and help in closing them up. Obviously you pour it on the wound and you light it up and, and fire cauterizes. But beyond that, they, they weren't able to find much use for the black powder until someone said, hey, you know, we noticed it makes this nice little flash when you, when you add fire to it. Let's see if we can make something go, and it makes noise, so why don't we make some uh, firecrackers? So they made firecrackers out of them, and, uh, you know, for a long time, that's how it was used. Medicine or firecrackers as entertainment or things of that nature. It wasn't until 904 AD that someone got the idea to actually weaponize black powder and turn it into gunpowder. They you know, changed the formula up a little bit just to make it a more potent thing. And then as that happened, we started seeing new things like cannons and new projectiles. Basically, they would take arrows and put a little canister of gunpowder to it and extend the range. Um, of course, they could aim it very well, and quite often, more often than not, the, the little missiles with the arrowheads would go, you know, wherever they wanted to go. But the cannons seemed to work pretty well. So as the Chinese were developing this over in Japan, um, due to a lack of resources and due to a lack of knowledge, that was not going on. So, so Japan did not was not going after uh, an immortality serum or anything like that. So gunpowder or black powder was not on their radar at that point. Now, as soon as Japan and China started trading with each other, that's when you start getting an exchange of ideas. A lot of Japanese technology is based on Chinese technology. As a matter of fact, a lot of things in Japanese are based on Chinese thoughts and, and discoveries. And this is no different. So as Japanese merchants are seeing these tepo, these cannon for the first time, these Chinese cannon called Teppo Cannon, they say, oh, you know, we could probably use those. And so they would purchase them and purchase the gunpowder and bring it back to Japan. Um, again, due to the fact that Japan was kind of resource poor and, or they didn't exactly know how to make these things, how to make gunpowder and how to make cannon very well, they relied on actually buying it from the Chinese. So that's kind of how the Japanese first got... Um, got knowledge of gunpowder. So they knew about gunpowder. They knew about black powder weapons before uh, they created the Tanegashima matchlock. It's just that it was um, somebody else's idea that they just kind of latched onto and they just, all they did was kind of just keep buying it, which was very expensive and only a few people could actually afford to do that. So let's look at a couple things that the Japanese would buy from the Chinese. Again, this is not something necessarily they would make very successfully on their own. They had to buy it. So let's take a look at these, a couple items like uh, the Teppo Cannon and actually uh, hand grenades. So here's an example of the Chinese Teppo Cannon. Uh, as you can tell, it's pretty primitive. It's almost uh, usually cast in one, maybe two pieces. Uh, the end where you would pack the gunpowder and the shot is kind of bulbous and that is kind of a recipe for disaster if you don't do the casting correctly if you don't 
um, you know, carve out the bore correctly, it can explode on you. So that was part of the technology that the Chinese had. It wasn't just the black powder to turn into gunpowder or creating a cannon. It's actually creating a design of cannon that doesn't explode every time you light it up. Now, as you can see, the carriage is pretty simple there. Um, it can be drawn by, by a carriage. Aiming is not that important because usually it's just done like shooting at a castle or a mass of people. So it's not like you have to fine tune it. You just kind of have to point and shoot. Um, kind of an inaccurate weapon after a certain range, but at the time that was high technology. Now the Japanese did not have the technology available to them to make their own Tebo cannon successfully. They were able to make them and they would probably last a few shots before the the um, the overall cannon would start to crack making it unusable because it means it would explode on them at some point. But these are the kinds of things that the Japanese would buy for their own armies and um, again this is you know, something they really couldn't do on their own. They had to rely on China and Chinese technology to get something like this. Okay, so here we have a primitive design of a hand grenade. So in this case, it's not so much that the Chinese sold hand grenades to the Japanese as it was exporting the idea to the Japanese of hand grenades. This is something that the Japanese actually could make on their own, but it also exposed a problem that the Japanese had with gunpowder in general. So the actual construction of a grenade like this is fairly simple. You make a clay pot, um, you either hold it out in the center to put the gunpowder charge in, or maybe you would also pack it with also additional sharp objects so that when it exploded, you would have shrap more shrapnel in addition to the clay. And as you can see here, there is a wick system to um, activate the grenade to make it explode. Now, the reason why I say it exposes the Japanese problem with gunpowder is that they hadn't quite refined um, a more explosive, a more better um, chemical formula for their gunpowder to make projectile weapons with. The Chinese have done that and they didn't really share that uh, technology with the Japanese, same way with how they didn't share necessarily the technology of making the Tepo cannons. So the Japanese were able to make small bombs like this that had limited uh, damage potential. Having said that though, because the wick system was very inaccurate in terms of timing, the wick could be really quick or it could be really slow. So if it was really slow, you could throw this hand grenade and it just wouldn't go off and the people you're trying to kill could run away, or it could be really quick and it would blow off your hand. <laughs> so this was a very, very chancy weapon. So at this point in time in Japan's history, they did have experience with black powder weapons, uh, but it was mostly in the terms of making bombs like grenades or actually large bombs with which to blow up roads and bridges or artillery. They didn't really have anything in terms of personalized weapons or the individual firearm. And the other part of it was, was that because the Japanese were not able to crack the technology at that point, Point. They weren't able to figure out really how to make a Tepo cannon last more than a few shots before it would crack, or you know, cre or you know, get away from using chancy weapons like the the, uh, the very primitive hand grenade. These things cost money, so they, you know, if they couldn't do it themselves, that means that they had to buy it from the Chinese, and the Chinese, you know, they they made them pay out the nose for it. So only the rich people could really have these kinds of things. So it was kind of a status symbol to have a personal firearm. Now, if you were a, a lord, a daimo or a shogun, you would want to have the Tepo cannon. So you would buy these Tepo cannon, you would buy the gunpowder to be able to use the Tepo cannon effectively. But again, it would be very expensive. So a battery of cannon would, might be only two or three cannon per army, but still it was a, a useful thing to have. So that denoted power. Now, in terms, like I said, with the personal firearm, it was a little bit different. That Nobody in Japan was making them. And they were able to come across them in Chinese markets and buy them if they had enough money. Again, they had to buy the powder for it. They had to buy the shot for it. They had to buy the firearm itself. And these were usually match locks. And the reason why you had them was to show off how rich you were because you had no practical use for it. The, no Japanese army was using them. 
Um, people weren't really using them in a day-to-day -day way. They were kind of like, you know, if you were entertaining, if you were a lord of the manor and you were entertaining visitors, you could go, oh, hey, let me show you my matchlock and let me fire off a couple rounds at a watermelon, right? So that was really it at that time in terms of um, Japanese firearm technology. Black powder technology in terms of the can, they were on par only because they were buying it but it wouldn't be until 1543 when the Portuguese would show up that everything would change. And that is a very important date for Japan. So by 1543, the Portuguese and the Japanese knew of each other. They even dealt with each other in Chinese markets. Um, so they were not unknown to each other. They, they, they traded and that was about it. There would be no treaty negotiations. There would be no trade negotiations. It was all just merchant to merchant in Chinese markets. That's generally how it worked out until 1543. And the reason why that date is so important is because that's actually the first time that on Japanese soil, Western Europeans and Japanese made a trade agreement with each other. And this happened between the Japanese and the Portuguese. Now, what was the world like in 1543? What led to that particular meeting? What what happened there? What was what was what was life like for the Portuguese, and what was life like for the Japanese leading up to that event? So let's first talk about the Portuguese. So for Portugal, things kind of started midway through the 1400s, and that had to do with the birth of a number of sons to the King of Portugal. One of them being Prince Henry. Now, because Prince Henry was one of the younger sons, he would never be king of Portugal. So that was not in his cards. But he would be able to do other things as sons in noble families would do. You know, there's their tradition, you know, your firstborn is heir to the lands. Your secondborn is usually military. Your thirdborn goes into the clergy if you have that many sons. Well, king of Portugal had more sons than that. <laughs> so Henry was um, he had to find something for himself to do to make his mark, to make himself useful to the kingdom. And one of the things that Portugal wanted to do was to expand their exploration. Of course, as we know, Christopher Columbus, you know, and various other explorers around that time were starting to be able to find new lands out west. And so Prince Henry wanted to improve on that. And what he did was for every, he did it for Portugal, but wound up everybody using his, his innovations, was that he improved nautical science. He became what is known today as Prince Henry the Navigator. He improved the navigational sciences, he improved the mathematics behind it, um, he supported new um, nautical engineering for ships, um, just, uh, you know, anything that had to do with exploration by sea he was behind it and he supported it and if he didn't make the innovations he supported those who did and even more importantly was that he set up schools and universities to this effect so he would actually set up a number of schools so that if you wanted to be in the merchant um, navy of portugal you would go through these schools and you would become a, a seaman. So it wasn't just learning about how the tie knots and you know how to read the wind and the waves and things like that. It was also about how to make an exact uh, position for your ship so you know where you're going. How to make better ships, how to repair those ships, and how to improve upon the mathematics and the sciences. So if you were a seaman for, for the Portugal Merchant Navy, you actually had to have a little bit of a brain you, you know you didn't have to be a genius or anything but you know you you were kind of better than your counterparts in say spain or england or france so as a result portugal was able to expand greatly into the world the problem was was that the spanish also learned from what prince henry did so after the death of prince henry um or around the, around his death the Portuguese and the Spanish were bumping into each other in various territories. Now, the difference between the Spaniards and the Portuguese was that the Spaniards was able, were able to take land and keep it and rule it. The Portuguese knew that they couldn't do that, so what they did is they, they decided to create an economic empire. 
However, that means makes creating uh, negotiations with the people, the natives at, at hand. It also means creating ports. So there is a little bit of land management. And so that's what they wanted to do, but they kept butting heads with the Spanish. So finally in 1494, just as a big war between Portugal and their allies and the Spanish and their allies was about to erupt, the Pope said, nope, we're not having this. This ain't a thing. We're not doing it. Look, I'm going to draw a line in the Atlantic right here. We're calling it the line of demarcation. Spain, you get everything to the west. Portugal, you get everything to the east. Have fun. Don't bump into each other. Don't go to war. <laughs> so that was basically how the Portuguese went east. They were basically told so by the Pope. Now, they were able to expand their economic empire much more quickly than the Spanish. And as they went eastwards, they, they you know went across the land, and they were actually able, due to their navigational technology, create better maps. And so the maps that you see for the Portuguese as they go around um, Africa and go around to India, and then go around uh, Vietnam and up China and to South Korea, they're pretty accurate maps for the time. Now here's the other part of it: is that the the Portuguese created a ship called the Caravel, and the Caravel was a smaller ship, but it was a much faster ship. So, and it was a cheaper ship to, to make, so that you could make huge fleets to make up for the lack of storage. So if you would have these huge fleets that would go out to these foreign markets that were far away, you could still bring stuff back and still make a profit even on perishables. So Portugal had a really good economic, strong economic empire. They were able to trade with people out in the Far East. They basically almost cornered the market for the Europeans as such that they actually made it all the way to Papua New Guinea. So at this point, Portugal is rich. They're maintaining a good empire. They don't really have to go to war. They're making good trade treaties. They're making good um, negotiation with um, um, native peoples so that they can make their money and be happy and be rich in life. So what was going on with Japan during this time? So the years leading up to 1543 for the Japanese is not that great. So while Portugal was enjoying a period of advanced nautical sciences which enabled them to become a powerhouse in Western Europe and to become an economic superpower and to enjoy untold riches and advanced nautical science, the Japanese were going into the gutter. They were going into a slow decline. They were not the explorers that the Portuguese were. They had no interest really going west. Um, they, their, their method of exploration was basically conquest. So they would go out and find territories to try and conquer and they would have initial successes wherein they would be able to conquer a piece of land, hold on to it for you know, five, ten years and then be kicked out. And now it's, that's basically their exploration. Most of what they did, how they treated the outside world was through markets and that was through China. So they, whoever they dealt with, whomever they met in terms of other Asian nations, other, other Asian empires, and limited contact with Western Europeans was through just merchant marketing in China. So they did not have a very strong economic empire and also keep in mind that the value of their currency was based on the production of rice so there's that so if you have a famine or a drought then you're going to have economic hardship and that was part of the problem that Japanese were having before things really went bad and the things that really went bad were basically because at one point the Emperor gave up his day-to-day uh, governorship of the empire and he gave it up to a shogunate that became eventually the Ashikara shogunate and they at one point were unable to produce an heir to the shogunate throne and that was a bad thing because while the emperor gave up his power was basically a figurehead so you can concentrate on other things the shogunate is what really ran the day-to-day -day stuff for Japan, so they had to be strong. They had to be able to provide an heir. They weren't able to, and the emperor at that time was unable to make a decision as to who would succeed this shogunate. And two samurai families in the capital of Japan at that time, which was Kyoto, went to war with each other 
basically, and actually it was just you know small clan action inside of the city, which managed to burn down the city after about a year. Then other sides jumped in, like once one half of the nation would jump on one family side, the other half would jump on the other side, and pretty much it came into this huge civil war called the Onin War. And it's the Onin War is unique in that there are no winners of the Onin War. Both families killed each other off. The emperor finally made a succession choice, but the person was so weak that the rest of the country um, basically fell apart. So all these minor lords and these very stronger lords would go, hey, wait a minute, I don't have to answer to these guys anymore. And they would go off and try to carve out their own kingdoms. So for a period of time, which became the Sengoku period or the Warring States period, Japan was experiencing all these little warlords from the clan level on up engaging in fights and violence to gain more wealth, more land, uh, petty squabbles, revenge, you name it, whatever reason they could think of the fight, that's what they did. And as a result, the, the nation of Japan, the empire of Japan suffered greatly. The people suffered greatly. Now, by the time 1543 rolls around, that we're getting towards the end of the Sengoku period. We're seeing the beginning of the end of that period. And the reason why 1543 is so important for the Japanese is that they are provided a technological instrument that they can use to actually make progress with. And Oda Nobunaga uses the Tanegashima matchlock to great effect. So... In 1543, the Portuguese and the Japanese would meet for the very first time on Japanese soil face to face and create a treaty negotiation as opposed to just trading with each other in China. And this is very important because it opens up Japan to the West a little bit, to the Portuguese in particular, and it all happened by accident, literally by accident. So let's talk about that accident. So the Portuguese are doing really well for themselves. They have a huge economic empire. Uh, they can't really hold territories like the other European nations like France and Spain, but in terms of economic power, they are a superpower. They are a power to be reckoned with. They were, because of the line of demarcation, able to go east into very profitable markets, into lands that are already settled, that already has civilization, whereas the Spanish were going into areas that were not as developed. So when the Portuguese were going down the west coast of Africa, they were dealing with African nations and African tribes that already had a pretty solid system of merchant trade. So they were able to, from the Africans, get various uh, fruits and vegetables that you don't normally see in Europe, and they were able to make money off of that. They were also able to make a little bit of metal wealth. They discovered that there were some nice, precious metals in the area. So they were able to kind of take advantage of that. And of course, unfortunately, there was the whole slave trade thing that the Portuguese decided, sure, why not? And which is unfortunate for obvious reasons. And then they would continue to go down. They would come up the, uh, the east coast of Africa. They would come up along Madagascar, which is a nice little trove of spices right there. And they continued on to India where they found out that this is how they're going to get rich. And they, India is full of spices, and they're willing to trade, and they, they're a solid empire, solid nations, and they are more than willing to deal with the Portuguese. So Portuguese set up a lot of ports along the India coastlines. And as a result, they're able to even expand their economic powerhouse empire into Far East. They're able to go into the South Pacific. And they create a major port in the South Pacific for the, the European countries. And that is in what we know today as Papua New Guinea. As a result of the spice trade with India, they're able to do this. Because after all, the spice must flow. Name the reference. Anyway, so as they create this port in Papua New Guinea, they have direct access to the Chinese markets. Now... It is in the Chinese markets where they come across the Japanese. 
and they trade with the Japanese. They do business with the Japanese merchants that are there. The few of them that are there because the Japanese have a very strict control over who can be merchants and who can leave the islands and who has to stay in the islands. That's That, that was a thing. So the Portuguese and the Japanese knew of each other and they even dealt with each other. But as nations, they never did anything with each other. They never made any treaty negotiations like the Portuguese would do with the Indians or, or, or various um, nations in Africa. So these things didn't happen between those two countries. And they were basically told by other merchants, mo most, most of them Chinese, saying, you know, the Japanese don't really like non-Japanese. It's okay if you're Asian, if you go over there and deal with them. But if you're white Europeans, they they are a little, little bit reticent to the point of sometimes they get a little violent. <laughs> anyway, so the Portuguese pretty much said, okay, that's fine. This is the markets we want to be in, and this is who we are going to deal with. So in 1543, one such ship, one of many, one of thousands, makes their way in the effort to hit the coastline, go up Vietnam, into China, and go into the markets. As they're making their way to Vietnam, they get hit by a typhoon. A typhoon blows them around, it snaps their mast, it, it comes clean off, and so the, the, the typhoon just pushes the ship farther into the South Pacific to a point where they don't know where they are. They wash up on this island. And on this island, they're like, okay, well, we're here. There's probably some food that we can probably get. Uh, we're definitely going to need to make a new mast. We're, we're definitely going to need to get some provisions here. And we need to get going so we can sell our stuff in China. We don't know exactly where we are. We have to kind of figure that out as well. And, oh, hey, look, here's some local natives. Wait a minute. They look like they're Japanese. Wait, are, are we in Japan? Sure enough, one of, the, one of the people coming out to greet them is Lord Tanakashima, who is basically like, welcome to the Tanakashima Islands, and uh, when, when can you leave? And the Portuguese see this, and they go, oh, 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 okay, oh, we're not really supposed to be here. But as they talk with Lord Tanakashima, they come to find out a few things about the Tanagashina Island, islands, actually, chain of islands, and they go, we have a massive opportunity here. We, we've got something going on that, that we can really take advantage of. And so they start, for the very first time, a Western European country starts a treaty negotiation with a member of the Japanese government. So it's at this point that the Portuguese learn exactly where they are from Lord Tanegashima. And they are at the Tanegashima Island chain, or also known as Kagoshima. And as you can see from this picture, they are pretty far away from China. They are um, on the southeast end of Japan itself. And they are a very small chain of islands. It's, it's uh, not many and uh, it's hard to get to at that time. Uh, you can only get there by ship and the weather's not great around there. And only a couple of the islands are actually populated. There's a couple main islands and that's about it. It's, it's not very big, there's not very many people there. There's not a whole lot that the Tanakashimas think that they have to offer to anyone on the mainland of uh, Japan. Now, the bonus for the for Lord Tanegashima is that he doesn't really have to worry about the the Sengoku period very much. He's in a place that, you know, it's going to cost money and resources to invade his island, which doesn't really grow rice. That's the other part of this. So, he doesn't really have to worry about invasions. He just has to make sure that everybody in his clan is getting along and that there isn't another clan or a part of the clan that's trying to usurp power. That's really all he has to worry about, and, and he doesn't have to worry about that. So there's not a whole lot going on in terms of the violence that's going on for the rest of the, of the nation. So Lord Tanegashima has kind of got it easy. I mean, he does have lords that he answers to, and when they ask him for troops, he's able to provide them with like 20 or 30 men because, again, it, there's not that many people on the island. It's you know just a couple thousand at, at the most. But even though they can't grow rice, they grow something else, and what they grow is sugarcane. Now, for the Japanese, this is not 
a big deal. You know, sugarcane, you can pretty much grow it anywhere in the country. They're not really interested in doing that. As a matter of fact, pretty much the economy of Japan depends upon growing rice. So Tanegashima has no rice to really give, so he doesn't have to worry about being invaded because he's not in a wealthy land, but he does have sugar. Now the Portuguese, being masters of trade, understand the value of sugar. And the thing about sugar is that you can process it to make so many other things, like rum. You can use sugar in anything, in everything. So here they are in what they thought was the middle of nowhere, and they find this treasure. They're like, we can make a trade negotiation directly with the source. We don't have to go to China and deal with a third party to get this sugar. We can get it directly from them. How are we going to do this trade? So as as they're trying to figure this out, Lord Tanegashima is basically saying, hey, you know what? I'll tell you what, um, you know, this is accidental. It's not your fault that you're here. You're not trying to invade or anything. So you know what? We'll, 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 we'll trade for provisions and we'll help you get a, a nice straight tree, which you can make a mast out of. And then once you do that, you can go away. And then the Portuguese do what they normally do when they come across a new land with uh, people they haven't met before is that they want to kind of show that they mean business. And they don't mean it in a sort of a, a, a you know, overtly violent, they don't try to take over anything. They just kind of do a show of force. And usually by using their matchlocks, they can impress the local population and kind of sort of make the implied threat of, oh, there's more where that came from. You know, it's kind of like, you know, here's my boomstick kind of thing. And so they they made a show. They, you know, each of these ships have their own little bit of cannon, a couple cannon, and they have their own security, which are these matchlocks, which were actually a variant made in India, in one of the ports in India. So they brought these out, and they made a demonstration for Lord Tanegashima. They said, would you like to see these things? He's like, sure. He, you know, again, he's he's heard of these things, but he doesn't really have them. And so he sees it, and he sees an opportunity. And he goes to them and says, hey, look, we'll do this trade. And part of the trade, I want two of those arquebuses. That's what the, the uh, matchlocks, the Portuguese matchlocks are called. So I want a couple of those, and um, and, and we'll, we'll call it a day. And the Portuguese are just like, uh, throw some sugar into that, and we can get a deal. Sure. Okay, great. Uh, we're going to be gone, and we're going to be gone in about a year. Come back in a year, and maybe we can do some more trade like this, and, you know, you, we'll trade for your sugar. Well, you know, this is actually what we want from you. And so Tanegashima, Lord Tanegashima goes, oh, well, you know, hey, this actually kind of works for me. You know, here I get to get these kind of new weapons and with which to, um, you know, do things with, and I get to actually sell something somebody finds value in my sugar so I can actually get rich my little clan can be rich we can be somebody in the hierarchy of the Japanese um, Sengoku period so they agree to this to to this trade and the Portuguese leave they have sugar they so they have additional treasure to to uh, spend and trade with and Lord Tanakashima has various items and including these two matchlocks and he goes to his smith and he goes, make more. The idea is that what he wants to do is to reverse engineer these matchlocks so that he can sell them to interested parties on the mainland Japan. So his smiths tried to replicate the firearms and there's a piece of technology that the air forges cannot do. They don't know how to make a certain twist in a, per, in a piece of metal without it eventually stress breaking. So they have to wait a year, 1544, when the Portuguese come back and they say, hey, here we're back. And Lord Tanakashima goes, oh yeah, let's continue our sugar trade. And by the way, can you show us how to make these, these, uh, make these, make these guns? And the Portuguese actually say, yeah, and they showed them. And then at that point, that's when the Tanakashima Matchlock came into being. So now the Japanese, through this fateful meeting with the Portuguese on the Tanegashima Islands, now have a piece of technology that not only can they replicate, but they can innovate on. 
And those innovations, a year later, lead to a uniquely Japanese weapon, and it's called the Tanakashima Matchlock. They made changes from the arquebus of the Portuguese design and made their own design on this. While the technology is the same, what's important here is that the Japanese were able to replicate it. And in replicating it, again, you can make improvements. Now, within about 10, 15 years, other forges on Honshu Island were able to replicate those uh, weapons as well. So the Tanakashimas eh, kind of lost out on their wealth. But for Japan, what that means is that within about 10 years, about 50 forges were able to make these weapons, which is very important because Oda Nobunaga would eventually go through these forges and ask for a lot of these matchlocks. And that's kind of what helped him to reunify Japan. And we're going to get to that in a little bit. But first, we're going to talk about what is a matchlock. So now that the Japan has its um, Tanakashima matchlock, they were able to refine the gunpowder to a point where they weren't as reliant on China, China's trade to give them that gunpowder. They got to a point where it was usable for their own cannon and their own matchlocks to a certain point, but it was good enough. And uh, while there was still some trade for gunpowder with China, they were eventually able to get away from that. Now, what makes a matchlock a matchlock? So the matchlock is basically a very primitive rifle. Uh, it's a smooth bore, which means that there's no grooves on the inside of the barrel. Um, you want grooves on the side of the barrel, which is called rifling, hence rifle. Uh, and that makes the bullet come out in a straight line. Matchlocks are smooth bores for the most part, which means that they bounce inside of the barrel. So when they come out of the barrel, they can come out a little bit low or a little bit high. Now, the thing that makes a matchlock a matchlock is the match. And the match is, and I'm, again, I'm kind of oversimplifying the mechanics of it, is basically a chemically treated rope, small bit of rope, where you can light one end of it and it just smolders. It doesn't catch fire and just go up in flames. It just smolders. And you can blow on the end of it so that it gets to be a red ember and makes it hot enough to make the flash in the flash pan of where you put the powder in. And that flash will put it into the barrel and it makes and makes the gunpowder in the barrel go off, which makes the bullet go out. So that's basically a matchlock. So I'm going to show you a little video here. And this video is um, from um, a reenactment or a, a reenactor. Um, and the rifle that, or I'm sorry, the matchlock that he's using is actually a musket, but um, it looks, it, it's very much on a matchlock design. Again, this is an English version of it, but it gives you an idea of how a matchlock works because it still uses a match. So enjoy this little video. Um, you get to hear me laugh at the end when the gun goes off because I like things that go boom. So anyway, here's the video. I'm trying to keep my rawhide strung bow and my uh, arrows that were held together in part by uh, water soluble high glue. I'm trying to keep those functional on a day like this. That was a nightmare. Mm -hmm. So I think in, in relative terms, the Palatines probably had the worst of it if they had to fight the English on a day like this, just from the get-go because of the nature of the technology. And this was not new technology to the English either. This was 100 years worth of uh, tried and true uh, material. That, uh, all, again, all you had to do was train your soldiers to take care of it. That part doesn't seem to change in 400 years, just the way you go. Well, what I'm going to do, folks, I'm running very much late, so I know there are probably some folks who have given up on me getting this demo started, so I'm going to stop chatting for a moment, fire off a shot here. Then I'll come back up to that line, I'll tell you more about the weapon, what it was, how it worked, why they needed it, how they used it, and how that affected our history. Then we'll fire one more shot. <laughs> all right. Present your pace! <laughs> My name's Terry Bond. You can think of me as a reconstructed musketeer with this reconstructed for King James. And I am firing on the... Tanakashima Matchlock could not have come at a better time. <clears throat> Oda Nobunaga and his lieutenants, the Toyotomis and the Tokugawas, were fighting the war to unify Japan. 
and they were fighting many, many battles. Anything they could use, they took and used it. They found value in the Tanakashima matchlock in terms of defense. So what they did is they created small units, 20 to 25 men, trained to use these matchlocks, and put them on the flanks of their armies so that no one could get past them to attack from the rear. And they did a pretty good job at it. It was actually, if you had good enough ground or if you were able to create temporary fortifications and use these properly, you could hold out on your position for, for, for some period of time. So it was very useful to Odo Nobunaga to have these weapons. They, they just thought them as defensive weapons, though. Until there was a point in, one in, the, in, in, in a battle where Odo Nobunaga happened to see a proactive commander of one of these units, about 20, 20 men armed with the Tamakashina matchlocks. And he watched as a cavalry charge passed this unit. Now, this unit was designed and put on the flanks to defend the flanks, so they were not supposed to be part of anything else. That was their orders. That was what they were supposed to do. The commander of the unit saw that he was in a unique position to actually attack from where he was by using the matchlocks, and he did that. And he broke up a cavalry charge, a samurai cavalry charge, which was very hard to do at the time, by firing two volleys. The charge was about 200 samurai. 20 men, armed with matchlocks in two volleys, destroyed the charge, routed them. They routed a force 10 times their number. Oda Nobunaga saw this and said, what if I had a large force, a much larger force of these guys? Because the best part of this is that they're cheap to make. It takes a little bit of time to make them, but they're cheap and they're easy to train on. So he could take his Ashigaru, and the Ashigaru are the lowest trained um, soldiers, they're basically cannon fodder, fodder, and he would train thousands of these guys on the matchlock. And as a result, he had a huge force in the thousands of these guys trained to do this, and over the course of some battles, that entire force became a veteran force. So by the time they came to the very important battle of Nagashino, which is a stronghold, the Nagashino castle, of his enemies, one of his generals wasn't able to get, th to breach the walls, was able to get through the gate and, and you know, with, with his siege warfare. So Oda Nobunaga and Yasuo Tokugawa showed up to help relieve him and figure out a way to get into Nagashino castle and destroy the enemy. So he looked at all of his Tanagashima matchlocks and he said, got an idea. We are not going to use the traditional method. We are, but we aren't. So what he did is that he had a small force attack the gates of Nagashino Castle. A small enough force that it would allow the Nagashino clan to send out their best samurai on horseback to go out and kill this small force, because that's what you do during siege warfare. It's a small enough force that you can obliterate you send out the cavalry, you kill them, you bring the cavalry back in, unless you think you can actually break the line, and then that way break the siege. So that was what Oda Nobunaga was hoping for. So he sent this small force out there, and while this small force was was trying to you know take the gate, you know with the understanding that they weren't really supposed to, thousands of these men with Tanegashima matchlocks created palisades these wooden fences in a zigzag pattern, and they were three deep. So you had, you had three people, each one of them armed with a matchlock, waiting for the cavalry charge. So the small force draws out the cavalry charge and draws out all the Nagashino cavalry, which is most of the force that's protecting the castle. They think they can break this, they think they can break the siege, so they come out and attack, the small force retreats, leads them to the palisades, whereupon for the next 30 minutes, the Tanakashima matchlocks win the battle. Basically, they do a continuous rate of fire. So the first person fires, drops back. The second person fires, drops back. The third person drop, uh, fires and drops back. By the time the third person is dropping back, the first person comes back up, and he's already loaded, ready to fire. So it's a continuous rate of fire. They kill most of the cavalry. Not only do they kill most of the cavalry, they kill almost all the Nagashino leaders. So there's nobody there to coordinate any defense whatsoever. Oda Nobunaga and Dokugawa Iyasu managed to walk in after that, 
take the castle, take the stronghold. This was 1575, and it's considered to be Japan's first modern battle using modern techniques and modern technology. And from that point on, generals on both sides in Japan started grabbing up as many matchlocks as they could to try and win the war. So that's the importance of the Tanegashima matchlock. Before this point, uh, the, the Japanese military was fairly simple. You had, going from top to bottom, you had the Lord of the Manor, <clears throat> you had his generals who were usually samurai, you had the officers of the army, which were also, again, at samurai. You would have a small professional army, which is which means that this is all that these guys would do. And the, the and they usually had garrison duties, so they were usually guarding a castle or a strong point or something of that nature. But it would be small because armies are expensive. So then you would have the cannon fodder, which is the, the lowest, least trained uh, part of the Japanese military, called the Ashigaresu. These poor schmucks, these were the guys that the samurai would be told to go to the villages, the farms, you know, homesteads, whatever, and go in and get, and say, all right, all the able-bodied men line up. Okay, you're coming with us. We got a war to fight. They would get maybe a tunic and a spear, rudimentary training on how to use a spear, basically saying, point, take the pointy end and point it that way. And that was pretty much it. And if they lived, they lived. If they died, they died. So nobody really cared about them. So what was interesting about the matchlock was that when it was introduced to Dashigaresu, it was introduced to them because Oda Nobunaga knew that the weapon itself was, it, while it took a little time to make, it could be made cheaply. The other part of this was is that it was easy to take care of, much like any other kind of weapon of, of the time, and most importantly, anybody could be trained on it. So if you had enough of these weapons that had a really devastating effect, then if you had a whole bunch of Ashigaresu, like thousands of them armed with these things, you could do some pretty good damage, right? So that's how the face of the army changed. Pretty soon, instead of having guys with spears who didn't really know how to use them, you turned out to get guys who had actually training on a firearm and were knew how to use them to great effect. And that, at, in, at the Battle of Nagashino, proved that point. And as a result, as I said earlier, generals on both sides, everywhere in Japan, was just like, oh, we got to get ourselves these matchlocks. We got to get, we, we get our people trained on this stuff because this is the, the way of the future. So when we look at the samurai and we look at, at their interaction with the matchlock, um, they liked them. They, they liked the matchlock, but they didn't see them at first as a offensive weapon like everybody else at first. They kind of saw it as more of a personal kind of weapon of protection if you're out in the middle of the battlefield, someone knocks your weapon out of your hand, at least you can pull out this pistol, boom, give yourself some time to pick up a weapon or somebody else's weapon and keep going. That's kind of how they looked at it. They thought it was useful in that regard. So it was not unusual to see samurai in battle with one or two matchlock pistols. So they they had use for them, therefore they, they didn't really look down on them as, as the movies would suggest. But here's the other way that it changed <clears throat> the samurai. So the samurai, as I said, are considered the officers of a lord's army, which meant that they kind of have to know the weapons that are being used by the force that they are commanding, whether it's a small force of 10 men or it's a large force of thousands. They have to have an idea of this. So as the armies began to become more and more uh, armed with these matchlocks and more and more the Ashigaretsu are being trained on these, he needed samurai to be able to keep up with that training and lead these men into battle using these specific type of weapons. So the samurai started to learn how to use them. And because they had the, because they were being used more and more in connection with the cannon, they were becoming a more and more modern army. That meant that all those wonderful, uh, graceful moves with the katana or, you know, battles with spears or, you know, those amazing bows those things started to go by the wayside. They, they started to become historical. The matchlock was the thing of the future. So what you started seeing was low-level samurai going, okay, well, this is how I can make my station in life better by being a good unit commander, which means that I need to have a matchlock. Now, the brilliant thing about the matchlock, like I said earlier, is that it's cheap. Low-level samurai were not very well paid. 
Um, and swords were very, 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 very expensive. Not all samurai had swords, okay? They usually had other types of weapons. That's why you see such a huge arsenal for the samurai. Usually they had a spear, maybe a secondary weapon, usually a dagger of some sort, or an axe, or a pick, or something like that, but not a whole lot had swords. So you started seeing samurai using as their main weapon a Tanagashima matchlock. So these low-level samurais, they became proficient in this. They were able to train the the men on how to use this and, and were able to be better unit commanders. So to get ahead as a samurai, this is what you had to do. So the days of being a samurai and going into battle, finding another ranking samurai of some worthy and note and cutting off his head to be presented after battle so that you might get some favors from the lord you were serving, were over. That was done. Things like that didn't happen anymore. Now it, you had to be a better officer. It wasn't so much that you had to be a better warrior yourself and adhere to this Bushido code. You had to adhere to the Bushido code but become a better leader, a better officer, a better soldier. There's a difference between being a soldier and a warrior. So the Tanagashima Matchlock pretty much dragged the samurai into modernization. From that point on, as the samurai were abandoning their, their old tried and true weapons, and they were going with the matchlocks, which would eventually, you know, would turn into better weapons, rifles and machine guns and things like that. For many years afterwards, it was still important to be a samurai. It was still important to be able to you know, have that lineage, but it also meant that if you were going to be in the military as a samurai and not just be a bureaucrat and be a samurai, then you actually had to learn how to be a soldier. So that was a new thing for the samurai. So the age of the old samurai that we think of, that we see in anime and in the movies, the Tanakashima Mashlock pretty much put an end to all that. <laughs> That is the story of the Tanakashima Matchlock. Uh, you can see why it appears in so many different genres of anime, starting from uh, uh, Slice of Life, believe it or not, to military period pieces, action, whatever. It is everywhere in anime, which kind of makes sense because it is historically significant for the nation. Um, it, it Not just in a military sense, but in, in a sense of almost identity. Uh, the, the Matchlock... Um, is kind of like a symbol of a little bit of power, a little bit of progress, definitely of unification because it was, had such a big role in that. And it was a mainstay for uh, the Japanese army for a very long time to come. And while I have not been able to fire it myself, I have seen it fired and it is a wonder to behold because these, these firearms can be actually quite beautiful. They, they are very exquisitely made. Um, if you ever get a chance to see a demonstration of them, please go out and do so. You will enjoy it immensely, I think. Um, so, on that note, uh, I look forward to your questions. I'm looking forward to you guys asking me some stuff about this. And uh, looking forward to that. And uh, again, just to remind you all, my name is Steve Gearhart. I have a YouTube channel called the Anagi Observer. Please stop on by and check that out. And... Um, other than that, enjoy the rest of OnCon 4. Yes, the wonderful OnCon online convention. So have a good time, and, uh, well, yeah, have a good one.